Well, good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. As we look together at verses 19 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. And looking this morning at having confidence as believers. You know, we live in a, a world where things are not always positive. And as believers in Christ, we should be confident people. Because we have a great hope, we have a great future, but sometimes we lose that confidence. So this morning I want to talk about the confidence that we find in Christ and how we find that. As we look at Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 19. Scripture reads, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. As an associational mission strategist, I have the privilege of working with a variety of churches. Uh, The last time I was here, I asked you to pray for our 69 churches. We're down to 68 now. One of our churches has closed their doors. And unfortunately, that's part of the cycle of ministry, is churches will run a life cycle, and they'll close, and then we'll launch new churches. And we're a making a decision in the next uh, hopefully few weeks what to do with this property, see if we're going to launch a new mission there. But it's important for us as believers to be connected to one another and what's going on with the other churches around us. Uh, If you look at the New Testament pattern, that was what Paul did. Not only did Paul travel around and start churches, but he would get them established, he would get them growing, then he would go back and check on them, and he would encourage them, and he would support them, and he would help them out. And there's a model in the New Testament of churches looking after one another, supporting one another, and encouraging one another. Well, recently, uh, back in June, I got the opportunity to go to the Southern Baptist Convention in California. And uh, I'm a Southern boy. I've been in Alabama most of my life. I haven't been to California uh, other than one trip through the airport one time just passing through. And so as I went to California, I was interested to learn some things about the geography there. And one of the most fascinating things to me was the coastal redwood tree. Coastal redwood trees are the tallest trees on the planet. And we find them right here in the United States and California. These trees can grow to be over 300 feet high. Think about that. That's a football field. That is a football field in length. These trees are 300 feet high or more. Now, we got some tall pine trees down here, but the tallest pine tree in record is 268 feet. So we're still talking substantially taller trees out here. And with all the magnificence in the height of these redwood trees... The most fascinating thing is the root system of a typical redwood tree does not go more than 6 to 12 feet deep. Let that sink in. We think about strength in trees down here in an area where we have lots of tornadoes and high winds, and we think the deeper the root system, the stronger the tree. But what we find with coastal redwoods is even though the trees are so tall, their root system is very, very shallow. How does that work? Well, here's the interesting thing. Their root system only goes 6 to 12 feet down, but it goes more than 100 feet out. And it intertwines with the root system of all the trees around it. So rather than having roots from different trees individually clinging to the ground, you've got hundreds and hundreds of trees whose roots are intermingling with one another. So that when high winds come and storms come and floods come, they're not just depending on their own roots holding them in the ground. They are trusting in the strength and the support of the entire system of trees that they're connected to. And that's why very seldom do you see these large systems of redwood trees come down. Because they have intermingled their roots with their brother and sister trees all around them. 
It's interesting that a redwood can't grow to be the tallest tree on earth alone. It needs the support and protection of other trees in the forest to grow tall. In the same way, if the church is going to grow and strengthen, we can't expect to do it on our own. You see, Christ established one church on the earth. And our job is to connect with our brothers and sisters at the church down the road and the church across the county and the church that you passed on the way here this morning. We are to connect with those believers because we are stronger when we work together. We accomplish more when we support one another. Another fascinating thing about these redwood trees is they find themselves growing in circles that they call fairy rings or family circles because they all sprouted from the same parent tree. Do you know we have the same thing with church plants? A lot of churches in this area were started by the same church years ago. And those mother churches have helped to support and encourage those churches as they got launched and got going. And in some cases, the church plants have outgrown the mother church that planted them. And that's the same thing with these redwood trees. When the parent tree reaches an age that it can no longer be strong and no longer support the others, those new younger trees come in and take over the network, and they supply strength and support to the new trees that have been planted. So my take from the Southern Baptist Convention and the redwood trees of California is this. As a Southern Baptist Convention, if we want to be strong and continue the work that God's given us to do to take the gospel to the world, we've got to work together to do that. And that's why we have the cooperative program. But through the cooperative program, Mount Pisgah could not afford to support international missionaries all around the world. You just don't have the budget to do it. But when you contribute to the cooperative program, you are actually supporting missionaries all around the world by combining your resources with other Southern Baptist churches. And together we're able to do what we can't do separately. Just recently, our disaster relief team needed a new piece of equipment. It's called a skid steer. I didn't know what a skid steer was when I first came here. I, was just, I just knew what a bobcat was. And a bobcat's a specific brand of a skid steer. But when they have these disasters and they're trying to move trees, they need a skid steer. And the skid steer we had had been well used and it had been refurbished and it had been repaired and it was to the point where they said, we simply need a new piece of equipment. And it cost like $75,000. Now, tell me which church in our association I can go to and say, can you write us a check for $75,000 for a skid steer? There's not one. But through the generosity and the consistent support of the churches of St. Clair Baptist Association, we are able to order a skid steer and pay cash for it because of all the different churches contributing together. Again, it's the strength of cooperation. It's the power of cooperation. We accomplish more when we work together. So that's what I want to talk about this morning is the importance of these connections this morning. And in this passage, we're going to see three specific connections that I want to call to your attention. Now, in verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Let's stop right there. Anytime in Scripture you see the word therefore, I've always been told you need to go back and read the preceding verses to find out what the word is there for. So, if you go back to the preceding verses, in chapter 10, verse 4, we're told it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. In the Old Testament system, we were told that we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And the early followers of Christ had to go through this animal sacrifice. Now, imagine how disgusting the service would be if every Sunday, Chris had to bring a, a goat or a bull or a ram down here to the front and slice it open and let it bleed and scatter the blood for the forgiveness of your sins. That's not a very wonderful thought, is it? And what the scripture tells us is even though that blood sacrifice was done, it was purely symbolic because the blood of an animal cannot forgive your sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can forgive your sins. It was a symbol of what was to come. And so in chapter 10, verse 10, we're told this. By that, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
So the days of animal sacrifice are behind us because Jesus came and sacrificed himself on the cross once for all. The shedding of his blood has forgiven us of our sin for all time. And then in verse 14, it says, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So we don't have to have this repetitive cycle. One sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his blood for all people for all time is all that's necessary. And then verse 17 says, Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. So what verse 19 tells us is we can enter into the presence of Jesus with confidence because he has come to sacrifice himself for our sins. He has done it once for all time. And he is ready for us to come into his presence and remember our sins no more. Now, wouldn't you like to know you can walk into the room with your spouse and know that they remember your sins no more? Do you, ever, do you ever have a spouse or a friend or a family member that it seems like no matter how many times you ask them to forgive you, they, they kind of hold something over your head? Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus said, I will remember your sins no more. He wants us to come into his presence with confidence. He wants us to have a close relationship with him. And so that's what the passage says. We can have confidence coming in with Jesus Christ by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Through the shedding of his blood, through the sacrifice of his life, Christ has opened the way for us to have a personal relationship with him. And then in verse 21, it says, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. So that's the first thing. Confidence comes through a connection with Christ. In verse 22, let us draw near. And what it's saying is let us draw near to Jesus. Because he's left the glory of heaven and he has come to us. And since he has come to us, he has reached out to us, he has sacrificed himself for us, let us now draw near to him. If you want to have confidence to get through this life, if you want to have strength and courage to get through day by day, you need to be walking with Christ. And that comes through a personal relationship with him. You know, I've heard people talk about the difference between religion and relationship for years. And I'm sure many of you have heard the same conversation. The difference between religion and relationship. Jesus is not looking for people to follow a ritual system of rules. He's looking for people to live in a relationship with him day by day. He's wanting people who will sit down and talk with him on a daily basis. People who will listen to him on a daily basis. People who will walk with him through life on a daily basis. And the stronger we are in that daily connection with Christ, the more confidence we have in living out the will and the purpose that he has for us to fulfill. So, confidence comes first of all through a personal connection with Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you have never entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that's got to be the first step. Too many people want to skip step one, coming to Christ, and it's, well, I come to church. Church is not a substitute for a relationship with Christ. You can have perfect church attendance and still not be on the way to heaven because it takes a personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus said, I am the word, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Your church membership and your church participation can strengthen you in your walk with Christ, but it cannot take the place of your walk with Christ. Your connection with Christ must come first. That's the only way to be saved. But then the second point is this in verse 23. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The confession of our hope. What is the confession of our hope? I remember growing up, we would talk about a profession of faith or a confession of faith. And if you go back through early church history, especially the New Testament, 
the people were known for saying, Jesus Christ is Lord, or Jesus is Lord. That's the confession of faith. What does the scripture say? If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is... Okay, this is audience participation time. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is... Lord, say it loud. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Okay, you've got to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. There's a whole lot of people who will say Jesus was a real person. Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was a great teacher. Jesus was a great man. But they've never said Jesus is Lord. And there's a tremendous difference. Because you can go to someone of a different religion and say, do you believe in Jesus? And they'll say, I sure do. That doesn't mean we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Because they may be saying, I believe in Jesus the prophet. Or I believe in Jesus the teacher. But I don't believe in Jesus the son of God. And I don't believe in Jesus who was crucified. And I don't believe in Jesus who was resurrected. If we're going to have a connection with our confession of faith, we've got to understand the confession of faith is that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord of all or he's Lord of nothing. So we have to have a personal relationship with Christ, but we also have to understand the role of Christ in that relationship. What does it mean to be Lord? That's not a a word that we use a lot these days. Lord essentially means... Master, commander, boss, authority, the one in charge. So if we are going to make a confession of faith that Jesus is Lord, then what we're saying is Jesus is in charge. Jesus has all authority over my life. Whatever Jesus says for my life is what has to take place. We have too many people in the world today who want Jesus to be a part of their life, but they don't want Jesus to be the Lord of their life. And we see that in churches all across our association, all around our state, all around our nation, and all around the world. People who will come and they will sing songs of praise to God, and they will read scripture about God, and they will celebrate God, but they will not surrender to let him be Lord of their lives. We are called to let Jesus be Lord. That means, just like the old hymn says, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. Are you at a place in your life where you have not only entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you have also surrendered your life to him to where he is Lord because that's the next connection that you need to live in confidence. If you want to live a confident life for Christ, you've got to know that you have a personal relationship with him. You've got to realize that his sacrifice on the cross was for your sins and he has forgiven you because you've asked him to, but you've also got to Make that connection where he is Lord of all and you surrender control to him and to him alone. I remember growing up, the wish list of things I had for my life that I was going to accomplish, the things that I was going to do and the things that I was going to accomplish, the things that I was going to be. And there came a certain point in my life where God said, you know, that's a cool list, but that's not what I have in store for you. And I had to make a choice, do I go ahead with the list the way I've got it, or do I put that list aside and do what God is telling me to do? And it was a pretty easy choice for me. I put that list aside and did what God told me to do. So we have to have confidence through a connection with Christ, a personal relationship with him to save us. Then we also have to have a connection with our confession of faith. That Jesus isn't just a good man, he isn't a great teacher, he isn't just some famous person, but he's truly the Son of God, he's truly Lord of all. And then the third thing, in verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That's the connection through the church. 
You have a personal connection with Christ. You have a connection with his role in your life. But then you also have a connection with your brothers and sisters who help to strengthen you and support you and hold you accountable. And one of the most interesting things about this is a, a, there's a seminary professor out in California who, uh, when talking about this passage, said this. This passage of Scripture gives you permission to positively irritate your brothers and sisters. Let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works. He means that means we have the right to positively irritate your brothers and sisters. Now, I'm the youngest of four boys. I understand what it means to be irritated. I can still remember all the times one of my older brothers would say, Hey, Danny, you want to play football? I'd say, Yeah. He'd say, Go outside and I'll join you in a few minutes. And I'd go outside and he never came. Some of you may have experienced the same thing. I had brothers who loved to irritate me. They loved to do stuff like that. But what he's saying is, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we had the right to positively irritate one another. What does it mean to positively irritate one another? Well, my wife is not with me today, but I can use her as a sermon example. I have her permission. My wife has the spiritual gift of positive irritation. You can quote me on that. She has the spiritual gift of positive irritation. She irritates me. She irritates our children. But it's not because she's trying to harm us. It's because she's trying to help us. She wants us to do better. She wants us to be the best that we can be. She wants us to have the best relationship with Christ we can. She wants us to be in his will. And so if she sees us doing something that we shouldn't be doing or feels we need to be going in a different direction, she will apply some positive irritation to try to encourage us to go in the right direction. And that's exactly what this passage says here. We need a connection with people in the church who will positively irritate us to get back on track when we're off course. That's why, as it goes on in verse 25, it says, not neglecting to meet together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We all need people to encourage us and help us to stay on track in this life. And especially when it comes to following the will of God. We need people to help us when we get distracted and we lose our way. Because it's going to happen from time to time. And so we need to have those people in our lives, our brothers and sisters in the church, who have permission to call and positively irritate us and say, Hey, where have you been? How are you doing? How's your quiet time going? How's your walk with God going? What's God telling you right now? What's he saying to you? What's he revealing to you in your life? We need to give people permission to do that and not consider it an annoyance, but consider it a positive irritant to get us where we need to be in connection with God. You see, the problem is without these connections... We're not grounded. You've got to have a connection with Christ as your personal Lord, Savior. You've got to have that connection with him, understanding his role. He's not just a great person. He's truly the Son of God, and he has come into your life to guide you in all aspects and all areas. And you've also got to have the connection with the church. What I find amazing is we've got some churches that love working together and we've got some churches that just kind of want to do their own thing. And in every church, you've got the same thing. You've got some people who love the fellowship of the church and they love being around other people and you've got some people who just kind of want to go out and do their own thing. Now, here's the warning from Scripture. Scripture warns us, be careful about going out and doing your own thing. We need the support and the encouragement that comes from the connection with one another. Because the closer we get to the second coming of Jesus Christ, the more we're going to see persecution in this world. Now let me ask you, in your lifetime, have you seen any changes and how Christianity is viewed in the United States? 
Is it viewed in a less positive manner now than it once was? Did you know statistically we have fewer Christians in America than we've had in the past? Church attendance is down. The number of churches is down. The number of people identifying as Christians is down. As a matter of fact, the growing part of our population is the group that identifies as nuns, N-O-N-E-S. No religious background, no religious experience, and not interested in it. The closer we get to the second coming of Christ, the more we're going to see persecution. And the more we see persecution, the more we're going to need brothers and sisters to lean on and encourage and support one another. Now, I'm not a fatalist, and I'm not here to get everybody into a panic, but I am here to just quote some realities to you. If you look around the world at countries where persecution has come in on the Christian population, you know which churches get hit first? The big ones. Look at Russia, look at China, look at other nations where religious persecution has come in. It's your large churches that the government comes in, that the people come in, and they shut down. And what are the churches that survive? It's the small churches. It's the home churches. It's the community churches. It's the rural churches. And I'm here to tell you, as we continue to serve Jesus Christ between now and the time that he comes, We need each other. Every church needs the other. We've got to spread our roots outward just like the redwood trees, not just dig deep to take care of ourselves and try to hold ourselves in place, but we've got to spread our roots out and connect with our brothers and sisters down the road, miles down the road, in the next county, in the next association, because we need the support and the encouragement that we find through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ from those brothers and sisters. The tougher it gets, the more we need that support. So, very simply put, redwoods find strength, support, and protection through connection. They're stronger together. Christians find strength, support, and connection together. We are stronger together. Churches find strength, stability, and connection and are stronger together. And if we want to continue to function in that strength until Jesus comes, we've got to continue to spread our roots outward. And that's why I want to encourage you, get to know your brothers and sisters in this community. Now, I'm going to say something, and I think your pastor's going to agree with me, and if he doesn't, then he'll just shake his head and you know, we'll talk about it later. But I think Chris would say, if there's a church down the road that's having a revival... And y'all don't have anything here conflicting? Go to that revival. Participate with them. You got a church down the road that's having some type of singing and it doesn't conflict with something y'all got scheduled? Go participate with them. You got a church down the road that's going on a mission trip and you don't have a mission trip scheduled and you're interested? Go participate with them. Yes, have your home church that you participate in, but there's nothing wrong with participating in ministry experiences with other churches. It broadens your connections. It strengthens those relationships. It strengthens those ties, and it enables us to build a greater network to do more work for the kingdom of God. And because we are stronger together, we'll find an increased confidence through our connection. And again, that connection comes through three three things. Number one, your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, I'm looking at a congregation here today that I know many of you have been in church for years. Many of you have a personal relationship with Christ and you have had for a long time. But I'm also speaking on the possibility that there's someone here that does not know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. And I would be remiss in doing my job if I didn't tell you that the same Jesus Christ who died for my sins, Brother Chris's sins, and the sins of everybody else in the world, died for your sins. And he longs for a personal relationship with you. And today, he is simply waiting for you to accept his invitation to connect. He is ready to be your Lord and Savior. He has paid the price for your sins. He has washed you clean. He has forgotten your sins. He's simply waiting for you to accept his gift of salvation. The second thing you need to understand is this. 
You need a connection with Jesus Christ, not just as a friend. I remember growing up singing the song, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. And yes, Jesus is your friend, but Jesus is not your friend who's your buddy, who's your pal. Jesus is your friend who is your master. He is your king. He is your Lord. And when you enter into that relationship with him, you bow down before him and you submit to him. So while it's okay to sing, What a friend we have in Jesus... I think it's even more important to sing, he is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We need to kneel before Jesus Christ and accept his lordship and let him reign over our lives. And then finally, you've got a connection with Christ, you've got a connection with him and his relationship with you as Lord, you've got to have a connection with the church. The reason Christ established the church is so believers could network together and serve together in a family. The Bible refers to us as the body of Christ. And we all have different roles, but every role is important. You need to be connected to a church. Now, I know a lot of you here, you're already connected to Mount Pisgah. This is your church home, but some of you may be here visiting today. You don't have a church home. You don't have a place where you're plugged in, where you're committed to be a part of that family of believers. And that's the other connection that you've got to have. You need to be connected to a church family. I know too many people who decide they want to be Lone Rangers. And rather than join a church, they just go from church to church to church, and they visit around and around, and they never build relationships And they don't have the stability they need because there's no one to hold them accountable. Because they attend as long as they're comfortable, and then there was something those they don't like, they just go somewhere else. You need the stability and support of a church family that can get to know you, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and let them love you through it all. And let them encourage you through it all. And let them support you through it all. And let them positively irritate you. So that when there's things that you need to change to get right with God, they've got permission to come in and push those buttons and help you get back where you need to be. And I want to read that last verse one more time. Verse 25, because it says, Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. Matter of fact, no man knows the day. But we're told it could be any time. But what the scripture does tell us is the closer we get, the more we are to encourage one another to be faithful. The more we are to encourage one another to be strong. The more we are to encourage one another to be obedient. And I'm telling you, we are in the days when we need that encouragement. We need to be encouraging one another to be faithful to the church, to be faithful to the Lord, to be faithful to his mission. And we need to constantly stay out there encouraging one another so that we have the confidence to live for Christ in this world. One thing I noticed recently, and I'm probably sure you noticed it as well, with all this stuff with Roe versus Wade being overturned, When Roe versus Wade was overturned, you had pockets of people who were protesting in different places, but as it started to gain prominence, you'll notice the protesters drew together and started meeting in larger groups. You know why they did that? They find support and encouragement and strength in coming together, whether they're opposed to abortion or whether they're in favor of abortion. They find it's natural. We find more strength and support when we gather with others who believe and think like we do. Church, if you will gather with other believers, others who follow Christ, who have the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ and who think like you do, we can accomplish so much more for the kingdom of God. And I promise you, between now and the time that Jesus comes back, There are more churches to be planted. There are more missions to be done. There are more things that Jesus has in store for us to do. He doesn't want us to sit back in a rocking chair and wait for him to come. He wants us to be up and active and serving, connecting with those brothers and sisters to do everything we can to spread the gospel.